Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us from around the world. Welcome to NGO Monitor and Cameras event, Palestinian NGOs, the Terror Connection, and the Media's Narrative. My name is Eitan Fishberger, and I'm the Communications Associate for NGO Monitor, and I've been given the honor of moderating tonight's conversation. Um, so just a couple of things that I want to establish before the, the, the discussion begins. In the second half of the event, after both of our speakers finish with their presentations, uh, we will enter a Q&A portion. Please mind the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Uh, you can use that to ask questions to whichever speakers you want. Uh, if possible, if it's directed to a specific speaker, please um, indicate that in the message, in, in the question. Uh, and before I introduce tonight's amazing speakers, uh, I just want to remind everyone why we're here in the first place. For those of you who need a bit of a refresher, uh, on, in October 22nd, the Israeli Ministry of Defense designated six Palestinian NGOs as terrorist organizations because they are operated and operated by and for the benefit of the PFLP, also known as the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is a terrorist organization uh, and has been designated by the US, EU, Canada, uh, Israel, and other countries. Um, in response to the designation by Israel's Ministry of Defense, uh, there was just an endless parade of, of disproportionate news articles and opinion pieces and mainstream media outlets that um, were really very favorable to the groups. They painted them in a very sympathetic light. They gave them glowing reviews. Uh, they even, some of them even undermined the very terrorist nature of the PFLP itself. Uh, and this event is really an opportunity to delve into the media NGO relationship and understand a couple of things. Why, why do these media outlets, why are they so eager to report on these designations and play defense, quote unquote, for these NGOs? Why do they trust the information that these NGOs give them, you know, blindly, as we'll see in some of the presentations? And why are they so eager to give them prime spots in the most important op-ed sections in the country, in America or around the world? Um, so these are the things that, you know, we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. David Littman. David is a media and education research analyst at CAMERA, the Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting and Analysis. Previously, he spent five years as a research fellow tracking anti-Israel bias and human rights issues in the United Nations. David graduated magna cum laude from Case Western Reserve School of Law and holds a BA in International Studies. David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Atan. It's a real pleasure to be here working with NGO Monitor. It's a wonderful organization that does incredible work. Um, on this particular topic in front of us today, there is, of course, so much that could be discussed. I'm going to focus in on a, a few of the particular ways in which the media failed in covering this story. Uh, and perhaps afterwards, we can talk a little bit more about why the media failed. And I'm, I'm sure Itai will have some, some great comments about that as well. Uh, in front of you right away, I've, I've provided a few of the sample uh, rules from the Society for Professional Journalists, their code of ethics. Um, just a few things to keep in mind as we go through. Um, and also just to set the stage a little bit more, I wanna provide a little bit of the gist of the evidence uh, that, that Israel has uh, provided purportedly to, uh, to, to other countries to give an idea of what's going on. Um, specifically, the these NGOs uh, that are connected to the PFLP, they, they, they're connected to each other. They work through a committee system. Um, it's composed of members of these various NGOs. And to a degree, as you'll see in, in this next slide, it, it, it's borne out, you can see it in, in publicly available evidence. Um, I've provided, for example, a, a few names here that are not only connected to the PFLP, but they're involved in more than one of these um, uh, NGOs that have been designated by Israel, um, showing the, the kind of interconnected nature of this. And the general idea of what these uh, groups were doing is they would forge receipts and invoices to make it appear that the, the programs they were engaged in uh, cost a lot more than they actually did. And the difference would be funneled towards the PFLP to, to use as it saw fit. Um, and so one of the first claims I want to talk about that you saw in, in, in media articles about this whole issue is a frequent claim that there, there hasn't been any real evidence provided or very little evidence provided. And as you'll see in this next slide, um, to kind of set the stage, here we have Matthew Levitt from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And he's talking about the, the 
dossier that the Associated Press was reporting on, in which they used to claim that there, there, there was little evidence being provided. Now, what it really was, was apparently a PowerPoint slideshow, much like you're working, looking at before. Um, and where this is deceptive is because Israel is not required, and it would be silly to expect Israel to provide the, the, the classified information behind networks of terrorist organizations. Um, in the United States and the United Kingdom, for example, laws provide the government to designate organizations as terrorist entities, including charities, based on classified information that they do not have to reveal except in very limited circumstances to courts and, and excuse me, and to certain members of Congress. And in this particular case, there is an additional element here, um, as you'll see from, uh, from uh, a couple experts from the Foundation for Defense of Democracy, they pointed out there's court cases in which revealing information uh, would complicate, uh, it, would, it would be inappropriate, it could influence the outcome of these court cases. And these are little details that haven't been really reported. And where it also becomes a little absurd is when we're talking about how much open source information there really is out there. As you can see in front of you, there is this article from The Intercept. And you can see that they put uh, scare quotes around the word no. And they're trying to, the way it works is it, it tries to imply that there really isn't a whole lot of information, that this idea that it's well known that these organizations are affiliated in some way to the PFLP is, is, is nonsense. What this really is doing, I think, is, is covering up for the laziness of the, the, the journalists in terms of investigating these issues. And I say this because if you look at the next slide, there is a document from USAID from nearly 30 years ago. And it's talking about, uh, in part, PFLP, their, their institutional structure and how they used, uh, you know, the quote unquote, the, the, the grassroots presence. And they specifically list, as you can see on the side, three of those organizations that have been recently designated. And they clearly identify them as being affiliated with the PFLP, specifically the UPWC, the UAWC, and the UHWC. If that doesn't convince you, you can also look at the PFLP's website. Here's a screenshot of their website from a few years ago in which they clearly show four of the organizations that, are, that have been designated as being somehow associated with the PFLP enough to, to, to include them on their website. Here you have the UHWC, Adamir, DCI Palestine, and the UPWC. If that's still not enough for you, you can also look at just a couple of years ago, they included a biography of a recently deceased member of their political bureau on the PFLP website, in which they clearly admit, for example, that the founder of the UHWC was the senior PFLP political bureau member. And they also point out that he was, uh, he contributed to the creation of a couple other ones, the UAWC and Adamir. And so this idea that there's, you know, um, there's not a lot of evidence, it's, there's plenty of evidence as NGO Monitor and their website just peruse through it and you will find plenty of that open source information. And The Intercept in that article I referenced, they, they take it a little bit further too. And they claim that there's, there's no public evidence. Um, if, if, if you can go to the next slide, they claim that there's no evidence that the, the NGOs or, or members from the NGOs are really involved in, in, in terror activities or violence beyond uh, a 2019 attack which killed the 17-year-old Israeli girl, Rina Schnur. But a simple, again, a simple search, a simple Google, and a little bit of an investigation, you will be able to find that there are many incidents uh, of, of terror attacks in which members of these NGOs have been involved. So if you look at the next slide, I've listed just a, a handful of examples. And these are members of these organizations which have been involved in bombings at supermarkets. They've been involved in shooting attacks, attempted suicide bombings, attempted assassinations of a chief rabbi. These are, are violent individuals and this information is public. This information is, is well known. So the, 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 the behavior of the intercept in terms of trying to, to downplay the existence of this public information 
and 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 you know denigrate this idea that there the, it's common knowledge is it's lazy journalism. It's covering up for their failure to look into these issues themselves. Now the next thing I want to talk about is the the media narrative. You also saw of um, that this is part of a pattern of, of is Israel repressing civil society or repressing critical human rights voices. Here, for example, you have an article from The Guardian and they're, they're, they're claiming Israel's trying to crack down on human rights organizations. What they're linking to is an Israeli law, which simply requires that when a foreign or when an, when an NGO receives more than half of its funding from a foreign government, that they have to disclose that. You can criticize that policy, but it's hardly a crackdown on human rights organizations. Simultaneously, the, there's been a near total silence in, in the media when it comes to the PAs or the Palestinian Authority's treatment of civil society. And here I've provided a, a, a number of Palestinian Authority laws that have been instituted. Um, for example, in 2000, they assigned regulation of NGOs to the interior minister, the same minister in charge of uh, the, the preventive security force, which is notorious for repressing critics of the Palestinian Authority. In 2007 and 2011, they extended that and they deepened it. They basically gave the minister the ability to, to shut down and dissolve NGOs, which they did do. In 2007, I think they dissolved something like 100. NGO is based on, on the powers given to the interior minister. Even just earlier this year in 2021, you saw a, a particularly egregious example in which the PA effectively, in the words of one Begin Sadat Center expert, they effectively nationalized NGOs by requiring that their work plans conform with that of the PAs, the Palestinian authorities, which really takes away any ability of these NGOs to truly be independent. Where this is problematic is that you saw in many articles uh, the, the journalists citing and quoting the Palestinian Authority and its officials without providing a context of the Palestinian Authority's activities and, and repression of civil society and the motives behind it. Now, moving on to, to another frequent claim that I saw in, in, in the media articles about the, the designation is that or I should put it, there was an attempt to portray these six organizations as, as serious objective human rights organizations because they also happen to criticize the Palestinian Authority. And this is one of the most frequent claims I saw in, in examining many of the articles. Here you see in the Washington Post, uh, they, they even kind of doubled down and they claim uh, that these organizations were also seeking to bring Palestinians in front of the International Criminal Court. Of course, that's that's they're playing word games here. No such thing. Uh, if you look into their, their representations about the ICC, I, I can't recall a single incident in which they ever uh, sought to bring Palestinians to the ICC as opposed to just Israel. And this, this, this idea that these organizations must be legitimate or serious groups because they also criticize the Palestinian Authority would be silly to any casual observer of Palestinian politics because interfactional rivalry is, is a feature of Palestinian politics. And uh, the PFLP is a big rival of, of Fatah. They've had serious disagreements on key issues. And even going back to that screenshot, as you see in front of you that I presented before, if you see in a circle, there's an article right there of Khalid Barakat, a, a uh, important figure in the PFLP, criticizing Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas. So this, this portrayal of, of the idea that they might have also criticized the PA as, as somehow uh, showing objectivity and that these are serious human rights groups is, is rather silly. Now, the next issue I want to talk about is as Eitan alluded to earlier, the all too frequent willingness in the media to downplay terrorism and downplay violence when it comes from the Palestinian Authority. And as you'll see in this next slide, I've, I've provided some examples of, of the language they use. Here from the BBC, you have very deceptive wording where they try to imply 
that the PFLP's terrorism is is a thing of the past, that uh, it's it's hasn't really happened since the early 2000s. In the next example, they're a little more blunt from the Guardian. They straight up say in the past. Now, anyone who pays attention will know the PFLP was involved in, for example, shooting rockets at Israel earlier this year. They've been involved in some notorious acts of terrorism in over the last decade, for example, Rina Schnurb, the Harnoff Synagogue Massacre. Um, the idea that the PFLP has, has, has somehow stopped in its violent activity is very mon much a figment of, uh, of, uh, of the imagination for these journalists, apparently. In the next example, you'll see the Associated Press trying to imply that the terrorism of the PFLP is only against Israelis. And this is downplaying the fact that the PFLP is very much an international terrorist organization. As Yitan mentioned earlier, they're designated by more than just Israel. And students of history will know that the PFLP's notoriety largely came from their attacks on Jewish targets in Europe and their hijacking of planes throughout Europe. And those obviously involve Israelis, but a lot of non-Israelis too. In the final example, you'll see CNN, and they use uh, uh, a, almost an obscene description of the PFLP, calling them a secular nationalist entity. And, and, and this is all a part of a pattern that you see in a lot of articles of trying to soften the image of this terrorist organization. And it works in such a way to portray um, the acts of, of Israel and in, in going after their network of, of NGO fronts um, in a harsher light by, by softening the image of this terrorist organization. Now, finally, I want to very briefly go through the comparative treatment in the media of various nonprofit officials and nonprofit organizations in the media throughout history. As I'm sure my colleagues at the NGO Monitor will remember, there was this famous article in 2014 from uh, a former AP reporter. And one of the things he talked about was how during, uh, um, during his time at the AP, there was an explicit order that AP journalists were not to, to, to quote or to use NGO Monitor or uh, Gerald Steinberg, the director of NGO Monitor. This is important because all the things we've just talked about, who is better placed to present an opposing narrative and to present facts that might contradict the claims than a group like NGO Monitor? And compare this to what I saw was a frequent uh, reference and, and citation of a man named Shawan Jabarin, who comes from one of the designated organizations, al Haq. The Israeli Supreme Court, as you see in this quote, famously referred to him as a Jekyll and Hyde, where he cosplays as a human rights activist, but he's also heavily involved in the terrorist organization of PFLP. But you never saw this context provided when journalistic outlets like The Guardian or the BBC would, would quote uh, Jabarin. And this becomes even worse when they cited Human Rights Watch, for example, because, and I apologize for the small text here, but uh, Human Rights Watch was frequently cited as, as, as a legitimate independent source, notwithstanding that Jabarin is on an advisory board for Human Rights Watch, and this context was never provided. Now, finally, real quick, one last example on that is a man named Ubay al Abudi. He comes from the Bassan Center. And in this article, this opinion article from the Financial Times, you'll see he's allowed to call himself a human rights defender and to mock the idea that they can just be declared human rights or declared terrorists. What Financial Times never discloses is that Abudi was involved in an attempted double suicide bombing. That would be important context that the media doesn't provide. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with this. I hope these examples uh, help provide context to understand the distorted narratives that were presented in, uh, in, in reporting on this issue. And hopefully they provide you with a little bit of uh, tools to, to, to understand the issue a little bit better. Amazing. Thank you, David. Um, that was really, uh, it was a great summary and, and the examples that you provided really 
encompassed all of the key issues that, that, you know, I think are important for people to know about the media coverage in this context. And I also appreciate that the examples that you provided were from the U.S. and from Europe to kind of just show the international nature of this issue. Uh, with that being said, okay, now let's introduce our second speaker for the evening, uh, Mr. Itai Ruveni. Itai is the Director of Communications and NGO Monitor, a Jerusalem-based research institute, where he previously led the Institute's Israel Research Desk. Itai is an alumni of the International Visitor Leadership Program, a prestigious program run by the U.S. State Department that deals with issues relating to the promotion of human rights. He earned a BA in political science and Iranian studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he also obtained an MA in political science and international affairs. In 2018, he was included in Macquarie Schoen's list of the most influential young adults in Israel. And in 2019, he was awarded Haifa University's Online Ambassador Award for his work in combating anti-Semitism. Itai, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eitan. Good evening. Good afternoon or good morning, depends where you are. Thank you, David. I think you uh, did a great job on laying out our research. Uh, I, if David explained uh, what we experienced in the last uh, one and a half months with the designations, I will try to zoom out and uh, look more from the macro perspective and ask questions like why? why we saw what we saw and why how these connections between the media and the NGOs uh, comes to a reality. And for that, I will share my screen. Hopefully you will all uh, can see it. Okay, so uh, in our 20 years of research, we came to realize that the, the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is one of the conflicts that involve the, mo the, the I think, the highest number of NGOs, Israeli NGOs, Palestinian NGOs, international NGOs that works on the ground, or any NGO that claim to promote human rights and humanitarian agenda have to be involved in this conflict in order to, uh, in, in order to uh, put themselves uh, in the media spectrum or uh, be matter or be, be important in, the, in this discussion of human rights. And for good and for bad, some of the NGOs are uh, promoting uh, real human rights and humanitarian agenda, but the prominent ones, the one that you hear about, are actually uh, uh, using or abusing those beautiful terms in order to uh, promote and, and radical agenda. The media, when they're trying to report about this conflict, most of the sources of the information, let's assume that the media is innocent and no one have an agenda, still most of the information comes from those NGOs, whether it's in Gaza, whether it's in the Palestinian Authority, or inside Israel. And sometimes we have NGOs reporting on things that happen in Gaza but they are on their, their offices is in Washington or in London or in Paris. Now, having said that, we need to ask why? How come all the media decided that whatever the NGOs are saying is holy? And therefore, we need to look on a, on a, on a term from a psychology called the halo effect, is one of the uh, 500 and something biases that people have. And the halo effect basically uh, saying halo like, like an angel, it's basically saying that we as people tend to uh, judge other people or other organizations by one positive word and apply a set of positive values on this person next uh, that, that's standing in front of us or an organization. For example, if I'm saying that I'm Itai and I am and actively promoting uh, the safety of the rainforest in Brazil. There are places in the world that automatically will apply on me set of values that are not necessarily uh, has to do with the real person. He's a great guy. He's probably uh, all the things that he's doing is for the greater good. Same happened in the last 60 years with the human rights world. The word human rights 
on the Western society became holy. It became immune to criticism and it being misused and abused by political activists in order to uh, such kind of a safeguard. So they know that they will not criticize, they know that no one will ask them questions. And we saw it from the 50s to the 60s to the early 2000s. Everything that the NGOs are saying, the media take it without asking questions. Let's put aside the agenda for a minute. And we, we have thousands of examples from all this, the cycles of violence between the, the Israelis and the Palestinians or the Israeli and the Lebanese. And you can take uh, examples from even from yesterday, a uh, terror attack in Jerusalem. Whatever the NGO is saying, the media quotes without asking questions. Let's take an example. 2012, Israel attacks from the air, attacks uh, uh, Hamas facilities in Gaza, on one of the air rides, a building collapsed and killed a Palestinian newborn. In the same day, the NGO Palestinian Center for Human Rights decides that the Israelis are the one that attacked this building and killed the baby. No one knows how they checked it. No one knows what is the speciality in order to check such an event. Day after, the biggest, one of the biggest human rights organizations in the world, Human Rights Watch, repeating the same claim. Now, they don't have people on the ground. They don't have researchers on the ground. They just repeat what PCHR told them. In a few minutes, all the international media quotes HRW without stopping for one minute and asking Wait, how do you know who investigated and who, what is PCHR? What is their agenda? Now, the amazing thing that five months, of course, it came from, uh, from the NGOs to the media, and then it uh, put pressure on the UN to open an investigation. The UN uh, did an autopsy to the uh, baby's body, and they found that Israel did, didn't attack this building. It was a Palestinian missile that fell short and killed the baby. Now, I will, I will spare you the guessing. This news was reported maybe or in three or four outlets that dealing mainly in Israel, on Israel, Jerusalem Post, and etc. Now, this is lazy journalism. But we all know that in reality, it's more than just halo effect and taking NGOs as granted. So let me tell you a secret. All the media outlets have an agenda. Journalists are human beings with an agenda. And here's another secret. NGOs, no matter who, no matter what, are also groups with agenda. And when those two groups comes together, and if we're adding the funders of those groups, usually governments, European governments that share the same agenda, then you get a powerful closed circle of information or disinformation that is very hard to break. And let's see, a great example is the infamous cover of the New York Times from last May, uh, let's call it cycle of violence between Israel and Hamas. Here we can see how political agenda and non-professional journalism and the halo effect came to one unfortunate product. One of the biggest newspapers in the world decided that they want to put all the children that uh, got killed in the cycle of violence. So what they did, they used one of the Palestinian NGOs that got designated, by the way, a few months after, an NGO with clear bias, an NGO that promote lobby in the US against Israel, trying to sanctioning Israel with number of Congress uh, men and women. 
They went to this NGO and took the information without checking, without asking questions. And they put it on the front page. In two minutes, people debunked the pictures. And you think, and you say, wait, th this journalist or the editor that decided to do it, why they didn't ask all those questions? Or why did they ignore, like David mentioned, from a public available information that you can find in simple Google? Those are two examples of the passive way of taking what the NGO is saying and, and provide it to the audience, and the active way. When you know that this NGO fits your agenda and you can go with it, and you probably will not pay, pay any price for being, uh, uh, for being wrong. What, and I will end with uh, connecting you to what David presented and did a wonderful job on present our, uh, uh, our uh, research. I think he did a better job than me, for sure. Uh, the designations. Before Rina, Rina Schnerb murder, from 2016 to 2019, everyone knew that a PFLP activist, some of them connected to terrorism, working on 13 NGOs that funded by European governments. Everyone knew it. Governments denied the allegations. They did anything to be not to, not to be connected to this thing while giving more money. Everyone knew it. But, but Schnerb's murder, it, it changed the game because suddenly when they found out that the, the cell that killed Schnerb is actually, like you see in the presentation, is part of the uh, of tier one of those NGOs. Some of them was responsible for the money that came from the Europeans. Then the Israeli Secret Service took the lead and in a very long process, designated the NGOs as uh, not, not, not because of the employees, because they found out that some of that six of 13 NGOs were part of a system that is, is connected to the PFLP terror activities. And I will finish with a question. During the past two years, Germany designated number of NGOs as terror organizations. France closed NGOs like this. The US designate, designates NGOs all the time. It's part of an international system to deal with how terror organizations work. So why the designation of those six NGOs became an international event? And this is, this is a, a rhetorical question, but and hopefully in the next uh, Q&A session, we can uh, con continue with that. Back to you, Eitan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Itai. That was uh, really interesting to see you uh, expand on those uh, examples that David provided even further. Um, okay, so we're now going to move to the Q&A portion of the event. Just wanted to remind everyone about the Q&A button at the bottom of their screen. Uh, you can just click that and, and ask your question, and then I, would, uh, I will read them out to the speaker in question, and uh, we can have a, an amazing discussion. So without further ado, let us start. Okay, I see we have some questions rolling in already. Okay. Uh, this isn't exactly a question. Okay, here. From Deborah Glazer, the PFLP has more of a Marxist orientation than the PA, correct? Professors in the U.S. like San Francisco State University, Rabab Abdul Hadi, and her cohorts try to set up webinars with PFLP hijacker Leila Khaled. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, if I actually recall, David, you wrote an article mentioning uh, Professor Abdul Hadi recently. So if you want to just talk about uh, that for a second and how they've maybe, maybe even infiltrating the universities as well, that could be, that could be interesting. Yeah, yeah, that name uh, is definitely familiar. I recently, as you said, wrote an article um, about an event uh, that that uh, was hosted recently um, 
in which Abdul Hadi, along with uh, a number of other speakers participated in. And that was actually interesting because when we talk about public information and research, one of the other participants in that, uh, in that webinar was a woman named Charlotte Cates from an organization called Samadun, which was designated, uh, I believe in January this year. Charlotte Cates, it took me a grand total of maybe five minutes to type in her name in Arabic, search the PFLP website, and find that she's committed activities that I, you know, I, I, I went to law school. I would classify it as violating the U.S. laws against providing material support to a terrorist organization. She actively went to, as part of a, a PFLP delegation. In their words, a PFLP delegation to to lobby a, a South African diplomat in Brussels in 2016. Um, and that, that, that's another classic example of, of the connections between the PFLP and these NGOs. Um, by the way, Charlotte Cates, her husband is Khalid Barakat, that senior PFLP uh, member. Um, and there is definitely, um, you know, again, back to the question about Marxism and, 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 and the connection, I think it's, it's an important point to, to, to make that there is this leftist Marxist orientation of the PFLP, because I think to an extent that explains some of the uh, media hesitancy to classify the PFLP as, as a terrorist organization with the same brutality as a group like Hamas. And there's definitely a difference even between the treatment of Hamas and the PFLP. Um, so it's, uh, you, it's something worth pointing out. And it's something, as you said, there, there's, you're beginning to see a little bit of an infiltration with US groups um, that are, are trying to legitimize the PFLP more and more groups like um, you know, National Students for Justice in Palestine, which was involved in that webinar. Um, so it's, it's, it's something to keep an eye on because as, as we all know, uh, certain anti-Israel activists love to, to hijack uh, certain leftist or, or liberal causes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. So I have one here for Itai. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about Human Rights Watch's relationship with these uh, NGOs? What is the nature of this relationship? That's, wow, well, that's a question that we can uh, talk about for hours, but we don't have hours. Let's try, let's try five minutes. <laughs> okay, you, you, need to, you need to remember that Human Rights Watch, uh, in some point, decided that they are going to be one of the leaders in the in the political warfare against Israel. It, hap it, ha it happened during the 70s and 80s, but the main, the main event was Durban, at the Durban conference in 2001, when they are, uh, came to the front of the stage and took the lead. And since then, uh, we saw them leading some of the worst campaigns against the state of Israel, whether it's the recent apartheid campaign, and before that, the blacklist of businesses uh, in the UN. Now, one of the methods of HRW is to uh, use local allies, Israeli and Palestinian NGOs, to be part of their ecosystem, to be their uh, uh, subcontractors, exact, exactly like the foreign government's doing when they're funding the same NGOs. Um, but here we have also very strong ideological connection and it's, it's, uh, it's very well connected to, to what David uh, uh, just mentioned. The, uh, the fact that the PFLP and the Palestinian elite is a Marxist left oriented is it's, a, it's an entrance ticket to the elites in Europe in the US. And this is one of the strategies of the PFLP since, since the late eighties, is this, L, this alignment or this, uh, sorry, alliance between uh, the, the far liberal part of the West and uh, the far, let's call it left side of the Palestinians. Uh, so HRW uh, have major role on coordinating those, those organizations. They are friends, they have personal connections, like David showed, 
they 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 share even uh, uh, you know board members or uh, campaigns or reports together uh, therefore we we think that hrw is one of the main um the main leaders of of taking those six ngos or more and make them internationally recognized okay thank you itai questions are rolling in here fast we have a good one for uh, i think for this is this would be good for david david this is from ann Scheingold. i think i'm pronouncing that correctly what can be done to undo the cycle of misinformation can journalists be held accountable uh, it's a good question. Um, it's difficult in, in the structure that you see with mainstream media um, to hold them accountable. Um, I mean, just to take kind of a funny recent example, just look at Chris Cuomo. How long did that take? Um, but uh, in terms of what, what we can do um, ourselves to hold the media accountable, I think there's a lot to be said for citizen journalism, which is a lot easier these days to, to look into the information yourself um, and raise the issues. Um, and, and it can have an effect. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the examples I like to, to, to think of is there's, there was an individual, Sam Westrop from the Middle East Forum. Uh, in 2018, he, he discovered and, and publicized that the Obama administration had sent uh, something like $200,000 um, to an organization called the Islamic Relief Agency uh, through uh, a, another NGO called Real Vision. Um, but they knew it was going to the Islamic Relief Agency. Um, that agency was designated as a terrorist organization in 2001, directly connected to Osama bin Laden. Um, and this, this discovery, this raising of the issue um, by, by Mr. Westrop and raising it uh, um, uh, attention to friendly outlets, which ended up uh, resulting in a congressional investigation into the issue. Um, and that's, that's a wonderful model of how you can uh, address these kind of issues because it, it shows not just raising awareness about the problematic connections, but how you can actually take action. Um, the democratic process, it works, it works. And, and, and you can raise these kind of issues because these are serious issues dealing with terrorism. Um, and, and, and most politicians still take those issues seriously. So, so you know, I, I can't emphasize enough, you know, keep looking into these yourself, keep raising the issues. Um, there, there's so many cases these days where, where the media drops the ball on a certain story um, or certain details, but, you know, good Samaritan citizen picks it up and, and forces attention to it. Thank you, David. And I'd just like to, to, to add to that, that, um, you know, like, like both David and Itai have been saying throughout the presentations, all, all, all this information is publicly available. So if, if you just do a quick Google search, you can find a lot of information that you can then use to, to, to you know, really accomplish what David has been talking about. Um, I have one for Itai. Itai, Guy wants to know about breaking the silence. Um, are they really former IDF soldiers? I think we can talk about breaking the silence and, and, and talk about Israeli NGOs more broadly and what their relationship is with um, these Palestinian NGOs and how that kind of interplays. Okay. Well, um, well breaking the silence is uh, some personal uh, a baggage that I carry with me uh, from the basic fact that I was, I, I served in the Israeli prayer troopers in the second intifada. I still doing my reserve service as a combat soldier. I basically been through uh, everything from Lebanon to any Palestinian city that you ever think about. Uh, and I know from personally, I know the moral dilemmas when it comes to being in a war when it comes to being in a conflict. And yes, when it comes to being in a conflict, that part of it is military involved in a daily life of civilians that are not your, your civilians. And there are many dilemmas, there are many questions, there are many, many incidents. From this to what breaking the silence became in the last decade, it's, it's not, it's just heaven and earth, earth nothing nothing to be compared. 
Breaking the silence, yes, there are former Israeli soldiers. So what? If I'm being very cynical, they um, political activists that using the fact that they saw something and their mind couldn't analyze the complicity and the and, and the gray area of this thing that called serving the Israeli army. And they chose to go and, and instead of promoting this, this discussion inside Israel, and it's fine, you can do it. You can be against an Israeli presence in the West Bank and still being pro-Israeli. It's, it's, it's totally fine. But from here to uh, give an anonymous lack of context testimonies, to call Israel an apartheid state, to help bring Israel um, uh, in front of the International Criminal Court, to be best bodies with PFLP designated NGOs. This is, this is not breaking the silence. This is the contrary. This is keeping the same ecosystem of, uh, of radical activists that only uh, want to gain political uh, gain or economical gain. Regarding the funders, breaking the signings is mainly uh, funded by Europe, friendly European governments. What brings me to ask, what will happen if Israel will fund the same organization in another democratic country? Uh, I think the Israeli ambassador will be kicked out in two minutes. Uh, but this is another story of the whole phenomenon of European governments that funds Israeli NGOs in order to affect the, the inner discourse. But sorry for the passion. Breaking the silence is something that is very uh, relates to me. Uh, to, to me as well. But can, do, you, do you mind just touching upon maybe the, the reaction of, the, of some of the more prominent Israeli NGOs like Breaking the Silence and B'Tselem? to these designations sort of yeah, what was the reaction and, and why why such a why was the reaction like that okay so so let's first of all um i know it's not so uh, uh fashionable to say it israel did very bad job with the designations when it came to public diplomacy okay no one will convince me otherwise from the from the, the fact is that i personally knew i had the designations in my hand before the top tier of the Israeli government knew about it. And I didn't stole it from any safe. I just downloaded it in the, uh, someone sent it to me in WhatsApp after he downloaded it from, from uh, the Ministry of Justice website. Now, the response was, um, we anticipated such a response. Th those groups are the same people with the same funders in the, in the same circles. They're working together and for each other. And whoever, if there are groups or people that dare not to in line with those groups, they're being, they're being outcasted. We saw it. Unfortunately, groups like B'Tselem and Breaking the Silence became radicalized in the last few years, mainly because they don't find the audience inside Israel. Israelis also formed the Zionist left, just don't believe them, just think they are too much uh, political in order to be called human rights organizations. And the, an example is from yesterday. A series of prominent people from the Israeli left uh, watched the video from yesterday terror attack and said the police officers uh, did good. They did what they had to do. The only Israeli organization that tweeted in English, not in Hebrew, okay, that it was a pure, ex uh, uh, it was a, um, it wasn't like a, they didn't neutralize terrorists, it was a, 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 just an execution on the street was B'Tselem. Why? Did you investigate it so, so fast? And why in English? Why not in Hebrew? So I think those organizations are getting more and more radical, but also more and more powerful.
in the international arena. And, and if I may just add one point, it's not only about NGOs to NGOs, it's also NGOs to media. David pointed out, and I, I gave an example from the last designations. One of the prominent um, policy paper, uh, policy newspapers uh, published in, a, in, a, in, in an op-ed, everything is against NGO Monitor and how we are, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, how we went after the poor human rights organizations. When we checked, we saw something very interesting. One of the deputy editors, uh, his previous job was in a foundation that among the rest funded three of the six designated NGOs. So the closed circle is not only between the information and the NGOs and the funders, it's also the same people in the media. If I was an honest journalist, I will never cover an NGO that I was involved in its funding in my last job. So it's all, it's kind of a spider web that, that feeding itself. Wow, okay, well, thank you, Itai. Um, and you mentioned op-eds, which I think is a good segue for this next question for David. Uh, David, can you explain how the media coverage uh, about these designations has differed in the op-ed sections of, of the media as opposed to you know, traditional uh, news articles? And you know, just, I, I saw a lot of, um, troubling articles in prominent outlets like the New York Times and the Washington Post, the Guardian, um, often written by the very members of these NGOs. And I'm curious if you could talk about um, sort of that coverage and, and how slash why that's the case and what the effect of that is. Yeah, um, in terms of the difference between uh, you know, news articles and, and, and some of the op-eds, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, there really wasn't much difference. Um, even putting aside the opinionated nature of some of the takes that, that you're referencing of, uh, from, from, from members of uh, these NGOs, um, the information that is provided in the news articles wasn't much more than you saw in op-eds. And this is what I'm, I, I was sort of referring to earlier about lazy journalism. Um, and I did see in a Q&A, someone you know, objected to my term lazy journalism. Um, you know, I should point out, I'm, 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 I don't mean to say that they're, they're, the, the journalists are innocent, that they're you know, doing this accidentally. Um, I'm more pointing out that you know, lazy journalism is not providing, not doing a serious investigation. And I mean that whatever the motivations. Um, and, and, and so it, it, it's very much true that a lot of these articles, very much, they, they, they just kind of read like opinionated statements. I mean, there was one associated press article that I would classify as, you know, if, if I had read it without a title, I would have assumed it was a press release from the UHWC. Um, very opinionated words um, that have no, they don't belong in, in, in a news article. Um, so the, the difference between the two, it really helps show that the media really did not do its job in, in terms of looking uh, into these stories. Um, when it comes to op-eds, it, it was also interesting to me, um, you know, you, you saw little games like in the LA Times, the Los Angeles Times, there was uh, the, the op-ed they had, I forget which organization I want to say was um, maybe Adamir or, or, or Al Haq, um, where, where it had two authors from the organization, but they only gave the first names because they feared retribution. Um, which, uh, give me a break. I mean, that, that's the LA Times allowing, uh, that's an act of editorializing in and of itself. Um, it, it's rather absurd to say that in a, in a, in a democracy, and by the way, these, um, these organizations operate in, in, in the territories, but even in Israel, they, uh, give me a break, it's a democracy. Um, and, and, and they don't provide that kind of counterbalanced narrative. Um, so, you also saw in terms of kind of the balance of op-eds, uh, as I'm sure uh, everyone would suspect that the one, the op-eds that were in favor of, of Israel's designation, you really only saw those in Israeli media outlets and 
maybe one or two American outlets. I think there was one in uh, uh, Newsweek. Um, and that was written by uh, 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 David May and Jonathan Chanzer from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. But in terms of like New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, it, it was very jaundiced. It was very one-sided as, as one would expect. And um, unfortunately, that's, that's the way these things seem to go. Unsurprising to say the least. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I have a question here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, let's give this one to Itai. Can you discuss any connections to Canadian groups? Regarding the Sikhs designated NGOs? Yeah. Uh, so. Well, believe it or not, it's not Sorry, only Sorry, Sa Sami Don is a, is a Canadian group. Yeah, yeah, mistaken, so, right? so, yeah. So two things. One, Canada has provided money to some of those NGOs. Uh, not, it's not on Europe. Uh, through some funding mechanism that regarding humanitarian assistance, but still the money ended up on those uh, NGOs. And don't forget, each NGO is not just the money going for some, some uh, nice words like human rights. They know exactly what NGOs are doing. Uh, they're, 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 they are subcontracting them. Uh, so this is one. The other thing is that Canada became kind of a, I would not say a place of refuge, but a, a place when the PFLP activities are, um, are surprisingly very public. Although the PFLP is a designated terror organization in Canada. And the example is Samidun. Charlotte Cates, which David mentioned in his opening remarks, she is an American living in uh, Canada. And for years, the, uh, the Samidun activities managed by, a, um, by her from Canada through one of the, one of the uh, donations uh, companies. I don't remember if it's like Global Giving or one of them. Uh, forget me if I, if I uh, got it wrong, but... Uh, for sure, there is. There are also local Canadian groups that that took the side of the NGOs. And I think a, a week ago, a week and a half ago, we had an event in Canada with the former Prime Minister uh, Stephen uh, Stephen Harper, and there are, there was a big cry out from some of the uh, of the NGOs against the fact that NGO Monitor even put their step on Canadian soil. Um, so it, that's that's how it stands. But it's not only Canada; you can find those things in almost any Western country. Thank you, Itai. So um, I'm going to move on to the final question for this evening. Uh, but before I do, I would just like to encourage everyone to, if you haven't already, um, you're you're encouraged to follow Camera and Geo Monitor, David and Itai on social media subscribe to the newsletters that we send out in camera and our email lists. Um, that's a great way to stay up to date about a lot of this information, <clears throat> excuse me, and to um, really just the, all, all the facts, there's an unbelievable amount of information, vital information on both camera and NGO monitors websites. So I really encourage you guys to check that out. Um, so let's move on to the final question for this evening. Deborah Glazer asked a question, which I think would be a good one to end it on. I think we can give, uh, I think we should give um, both of you guys the chance to respond to this and let's start with David. So Deborah wants to know how can we energize ourselves to deal with all of these issues given the overwhelming strong connections among the NGOs and the media and the strong forces that are aligned against us. It seems like we're always playing whack-a-mole and they're usually on the defensive. Yeah that's the that's the age-old question on this issue isn't it? Um, uh, you know always playing defense and, and, and the whack-a-mole um, like I, I'll go back to what I said earlier about, you know, citizen journalism in a way. Um, there's, there's a lot of value in looking into these issues yourself, learning the connections, taking the time. And I know not everybody has the time. That's why, you know, organizations like, like NGO Monitor exist to kind of help clue us in on those things. Um, and, and, but being informed. And one of the things that I think uh, 
you know, the pro-Israel community, for example, is very good at is being informed and understanding, um, how do I put it, uh, the bigger picture, the consequences. You know, we, we see on a daily basis a lot of things like, you know, some kind of BDS motion, for example, at a campus or, or a critical article, but we can see the bigger picture of where these things are headed. And here in the U.S., for example, there was a, you know, a very good big effort in, in combating BDS um, through a number of legislative options. And, and um, that's what I mean by kind of keeping a big focus um, and understanding the big picture, understanding uh, you know, battles versus wars and, and all of that. Um, but you know, kind of going back to the question a little more specifically with, with keeping energized, uh, a lot of coffee. Um, cause as you said, it's, it's never ending. Um, and I, I you know, I, I'd be lying if I said it was going to be, you know, anything about this was easy, but, uh, in the spirit of the holidays and Hanukkah, you know, the Jewish people and the Maccabees, you know, the odds are always against us. Uh, but it's never, it's never ended. Uh, it still hasn't ended for us. We're still fighting. It's very uplifting. Uh, no, thank you, David. Uh, and the tie. How can we energize ourselves? Well, I don't think I had in the last decade one lecture that someone didn't ask me the question, okay, so now what? Or what we need to do? Or what we should do? So um, first of all, I'm seconding everything David said about uh, looking on the, on the big picture. But I will give my, my analysis from few in few different sections. One is, first of all, understand the threat. Don't overreact it, but don't also minimize it. For example, BDS. There are some point that people refer to the BDS as an exact, you know, as the biggest threat Israel had, almost like the Iranian uh, bomb. And, and, and then the other side was from the pro-Israeli community said, no, we should ignore it totally. And I think when you come to such a problem or a challenge, first of all, you need to frame it, understand, understand who are the players, who behind the players, and then assess what is the level of the threat and how are you going to fight this threat? This is number one. The other, the number two is don't forget. And I think Israel as, as a whole forgot about it for many, many years. You are not fighting an army or a system with a clear hierarchy. You, it's, you are fighting ideas civil society, in a civil society form, which don't have any leaders, which don't have any um, uh, specific mechanisms that you, can, uh, that you can attack. It's from the world of soft power. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of who is first, who is, is, who is smarter, who is more creative. And the last thing, and this is uh, totally my own, uh, from my own experience and not as a representative of the Energy Monitor, in order to energize, energize like, like uh, uh, this, the audience said here, uh, we also need uh, first to choose our fights. Not every anti-Israeli tweet deserve uh, or anti-Israeli article deserve response. And second, we need to understand that every war or battle composed from a defense, but also attack in your terms, in your uh, language, and in your, uh, 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 in your timing. Uh, it can be a, pro a positive advocacy. It can be negative. It can be attacks. It can be... Uh, um, do something that the other side was never, you know, we never thought that he will do. It have to be composed from different layers and different dimensions of how you deal with problems. Each one in its own capacity, exactly like the other side is doing. Okay, if you're a local Spanish BDS NGO in some deserted uh, place in the middle of Spain, you do what you can do, but you do. 
this is the this is the rule this is their rule so uh, that's my intake on this uh, i have a lot of criticism on how you we doing it but um i'm not so optimistic like david uh, but i think we can if we uh, funnel ourselves in a good way okay thank you itai thank you david uh great everyone this uh this marks the end of the uh discussion today uh, I think we've all learned a lot, and I think that we can all use the information that we've been given tonight to ensure more transparency and accountability for both the NGOs and the media that report about them. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I'd like to also thank uh, Patrick Fox on tech. And on behalf of Camera and NGO Monitor, thank you, and have a great rest of your day.